Well, uh, now, without further ado, it's my honor, privilege, and pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce Pastor Garth Adderholt, joining us this morning for teaching. Pastor Garth? It's all yours. All right. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. It's always good to be here with you. If you don't know who I am, I'm, I'm a friend of Pat's and uh, was looking at your Through the Bible I think that's a through the Bible on Thursday nights, right? Nothing like the book of Numbers to bring in the crowds, right? But uh, hey, listen, uh, every number is important to God. Every person, every life he tracks, especially the state of Israel, all of their tribes, all of their peoples. And uh, even today, God knows uh, w what tribe each Jewish person is from. And he still has a plan to use them. And the Bible says there'll be 144,000 male virgin Jews, uh, 12,000 from each tribe that'll be used to be a light to the world at the, in the last days. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, when we look at Israel, they're not, they're not much of a light right now, but uh, God wants to turn them in uh, to a light. So we pray for Pat and Sandy that they'll enjoy their time uh, away and uh, in this 30th anniversary. But uh, uh, that's wonderful. So I hope they come back rested. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, if you don't have your Bibles with you, that's a problem. But I don't think you have a, that big a problem because you have one right in your seats, right? Underneath. So please grab it. We're going to look at a kind of a, a little bit obscure passage uh, today for those of you who are not Bible students. And um, it might be a little bit confusing if you can't see it on the page. So we're going to turn to Daniel. Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 8, and I'm going to begin reading in the middle of it, which is verse 8. Daniel 8, verse 8. It's going to seem a little strange to read this. Uh, we'll fill in the context in just a moment. Uh, just try to absorb what you can of what in the world is going on here in the middle of this, of this chapter. Um, let's do, do you guys stand to read? You do. Okay, great. Stand up. <clears throat> I mean, I'm okay with you sitting down and reading, but uh, yes, either way. Let's read together, beginning in verse 8. It says, Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn, which he represents, was broken. And in its place, there came up four conspicuous horns, Toward the four winds of heaven. By the way, I'm reading in the NASB, so it might be a little different for those of you in the uh, King James. But out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. Verse 10, it, the small horn, grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth. And it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. And it removed the regular sacrifice from him. And the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn, the little horn, along with the regular sacrifice. And it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Strange. Verse 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking. How long? How long is this going to be? Will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? And while the transgression causes horror. Uh, so as to allow both the holy place and the, the host to be trampled. He said to me. For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Let me pray for us. Lord, we need help in, in, in this. Uh, it is amazing here, but we know you've charted it all out. You've graphed it all out, and, and, uh, and it's very precise down to the number of days. And so we just ask for your wisdom tonight to open our minds and hearts to what is yet ahead of us. Because this passage, Lord, we know is pointing to the yet future. And it's amazing to us to think that all these things will come to be. So Lord, teach us today and give us wisdom and truth and make our eyes open to where this world is heading 
and for your plans uh, for Israel and also for all the nations of the earth. And we give you praise and we give you thanks in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. So let me give you a little bit of a quick, quick over over um, view of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel's uh, set at the end, obviously, of um, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. These are these prophets who were warning Israel to turn to God. Otherwise, God was going to take them away. And God did take them away. So that's what Daniel is about. It's about Israel being taken into captivity. But it also marks a time in history. God had a plan for them to be the light of the world. But they didn't. They worshipped false gods and they were doing evil. So he said, I'm going to remove you. And so Daniel is the time when it begins that Israel is cast out. And now we look at history moving along to the day when they would actually be allowed to come back in. And um, and so God has laid out history, the history of the world in that way that from the time that they were taken away to the time that they actually come home and worship the Lord fully as a nation. Um, there's been a long time period. In fact, it's 605 BC is when they left. Now, if you're a historian, this is amazing. To 1948. Now, and I know we skipped a lot of history, but truly they came back in, but they never were able to stay. They were always taken captive again and scattered abroad. And so all the way to 1948 and it might only be a few of us here that um, actually were here in 1948. I shouldn't say us because I wasn't here either. But we remember the, the early days of Israel coming back into the land and this nation forming out of the dust of the air. I mean, from all over the world. And uh, so um, we see here in Romans 11, 23 and uh, 25. I'm going to put these up so you don't have to go to these uh, verses here. So please read the screens. Romans eleven twenty three and 25 says, and they also, if they, this is speaking of Israel, if they do not continue in their unbelief, we're waiting for Israel to believe in the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. But if, if they do not continue in their unbelief, they will be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. God has huge plans for the nation of Israel. He's going to graft them back in. Verse 25, for I do not want you to be, uh, you brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. You shouldn't be ignorant of what's coming so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. That is what the entire world is waiting for. That's what the end of the tribulation is about. When all the nations of the earth are judged and they turn on Israel to attack him and the Lord intervenes and uh, Israel turns their heart to Jesus and we enter into the next age, which will be the millennial kingdom of Christ. Jesus is coming back bodily, by the way, and he is going to rule over all the nations of the earth. If you don't, if you don't understand that, you should read through these passages because God says it over and over and over and over. It's not going to happen in heaven. It's going to happen here on earth. And actually, we as the church will come back with him. So even after Israel has rejected the first coming of the Lord, Paul, the Apostle Paul, assures the church, that's us, that God has a plan to save the nation of Israel. Don't, don't forget that, he says. And then it'll happen after the times of the Gentiles. Now, that's, that's what Daniel is speaking about. This is the beginning of their domination Israel has been dominated by the nations of the earth forever, it seems. And, uh, and there will be a time when they'll come back to the Lord and they will not be dominated anymore by the nations of the earth. We see them being pummeled and harassed and threatened. And uh, in, in, our, in our day, it looks like the whole world wants to turn against them. Why? We have no idea. But it's because of the work of Satan, Right. To hinder the plans of God. And so Israel is the key as we look to them. Now in chapter 7 of Daniel. Daniel receives uh, this vision of four world ruling powers. And we can put that up here. Um, it's in a little chart here. There's, uh, he, he, he does it in two ways. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Uh, one is an image. The image of this um, um, 
uh, man here, and it, uh, it goes through these world ruling powers, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and then down below that at the feet, there's a recurrence or revival of the Roman Empire, and uh, that's about the feet and the toes. And then on the other side, Daniel 7 talks about them as beasts. So here's, here's, here's the main thing. We already know all of these nations came in history. God told us before they ever came uh, who they would be and what they would be like. But he describes them as beasts. Beasts are vicious. Man in his leadership to dominate the world is vicious. When we look at the leaders, especially world leaders who dominate, uh, histor history tells us they are brutal. They take, they crush. Um, but not only that, each of these are also working not with God, but against God to dominate the world. And so they have a hatred, a particular hatred toward Israel to remove them from the land. So Daniel, uh, if you want to put that scripture up here, um, you want to show the four um, beasts. Next slide. There we go. A little bit different picture uh, there. And they're described. And we're going to see that this final beast that comes out of the sea in the book of revelation yet future is going to represent all of these beasts he's going to be a culmination of all the dominance of over all of the earth and uh, this will be embodied in the antichrist who will be the ruler over that so you can just leave that up for well actually let's go to daniel 7 24 and 25 next slide oh i don't have it oh sorry let me just read it. Okay, keep the beasts up there. That'll be fine. We can look at them. It, it, it says here, Daniel um, 7, it says, As for the ten horns, this is this beast, the Roman beast here, this last one. It says, Out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones, and he will subdue three kings. There's ten horns on, this, uh, on these seven heads. And, uh, and it says, he will speak out against the Most High, which is against God, and he will wear down the saints of, of the highest one. And he'll attack the believers of that day and the Jewish believers. And he will intend to make alterations in times and law. He will alter the worship of Israel. And uh, they will be given into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. So this uh, last age of this Roman Empire in Daniel 7, he says it's going to be brutal. <laughs> and uh, there's going to be a season when this beast reigns. And it's going to be for a time, times, and a half a time, which is a time, one, two times, and then a half a time, three and a half years. And the Bible says very clearly on these last seven years of tribulation, half of them will be dominated by this Antichrist to kill, slaughter, to mock God in every way. And, uh, and that's what that time will be about. And it's called the last days of the Gentile nation. The last time that man has on earth to dominate everything against God. If you look at the nations of the earth today, they all defy God, don't they? They all act like they're in control. Man will solve all these problems. And it, and it, it moves into uh, evil. Okay. So in Daniel chapter 8, he ex describes this in a little different way. He, he goes back through history and he describes three horns. So we're going to go back to our verse here in verse 8. Uh, the, the first one is the great horn. And then he's going to talk about a little horn that comes up from that. And then he's going to talk about a future little horn who's just like this little horn who will come at the end of time. So um, we'll take a look at each of these. Uh, here is laid out. Number one, the great horn. Well, we know the great horn that was spoken of here is um, Alexander the Great. So he's the one who conquered the Persian Empire. And uh, when he did so, he did it uh, very quickly. He conquered Persia and he took the whole world. He swept through in no time at all. And he just dominated the entire earth. Nothing like that has happened in that kind of speed. In fact, it, it describes him uh, this Grecian empire as a leopard with wings and uh, on those beasts, you know, you can see the leopard with wings and that's that he moves so fast like a leopard that he just conquered without even touching his feet to the ground. So um, um, he 
um, came up very quickly, but he also went down very quickly. So the amazing story of Alexander the, the Great is that by the age of 29, he had already conquered the earth. <laughs> and I don't know what you did by the time you were 29. but And he returned home after that, and he was proud, and he was full of himself, and he got lost in drunkenness and debauchery. And, uh, and, and within a few years, he was dead. By the, but before he turned 33, he was dead. He basically died of boredom, really. He had no other kingdoms to conquer, but he was full of himself. And he's a symbol of the Antichrist because the Antichrist is going to come on the world quickly and he'll come to dominance and in, in, in no time at all, he'll be dominating the entire earth. And, um, and uh, just like that, he will also go down quickly because the Antichrist will only have three and a half years of this time and then God will destroy him. So when we look down here at 8b, in your text, it says, out of the broken horn, four horns arise. So God is detailing all of history. So Alexander the Great, when he died, um, his vast empire was divided up by his four generals. And so we see here these four horns that arose out of this uh, broken horn. And, uh, and that was his four generals, Ptolemy, which uh, was given Egypt and parts of Asia Minor. Cassander was given territory of the mass of Macedonia and Greece. And then uh, Lysimachus was given Thrace and parts of uh, also of Asia Minor. And then Seleucus was given Syria and Mesopotamia and almost to the region of, of Israel, the beautiful land, right? So verse nine, uh, out of them, it says, can come up out of these four horns, um, one little horn that came out. And, and this horn came out of the Seleucus, uh, Seleucid dynasty. And, uh, and he grew exceedingly great. And he moved toward the south, toward the beautiful land of Israel. And so he began to conquer south. And he actually wanted to go all the way into Egypt, which he did. So who was this small horn? This was a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes. And um, both Alexander and Antiochus Epiphanes were major historical figures. We can read about them. And they fulfilled Daniel's vision perfectly. So God says, let me just tell you everything that's going to happen. But the purpose of him telling this, us this in chapter 8 is for one purpose. Because I want to describe to you this little horn. Because he is a perfect picture of what will come in the end. So this last guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, we're going to read about him, but um, um, we don't get to read about him out of the Bible, um, but we read out of history. So there's books called the apocryphal books, and and they are history books, but they're not divine. They're not perfect. Um, but uh, two of the books are called Maccabees. There's two parts of Maccabees, and that's where we get all the details about this man, Antiochus Epiphanes. So... He started out in this line of the Seleucids and he murdered his brother who had inherited the throne, the Seleucid dynasty, and, um, and he came to power in 175 BC. And then we have a, a little chart here. We'll kind of read through here. Next slide. So <clears throat> Antiochus in uh, 170 BC, uh, Ptolemy the fourth, which was one of the powers of Egypt, one of the generals there who was given Egypt, sought to recover territory, then he uh, um, then ruled over by Antiochus. Antiochus came into Egypt, started taking more land to the south. That fulfilled God's prophecy. He moved south. So Antiochus evaded Egypt and he defeated Ptolemy and uh, proclaimed himself king of Egypt. And uh, this was, again, his growth to the south. Next slide. And on his return from his conquest, a trouble broke out for him uh, in Jerusalem. So he decided to subdue Jerusalem. So this is the start of his blasphemy, uh, the beautiful land. Uh, the people were subjugated. The temple was desecrated. And again, it had been rebuilt after they came back into the land. And now it was desecrated again. And the temple treasury was plundered. And he returned to Egypt but was soon forced out by Rome. Rome is coming up now, the next world ruling power. And he was moving out of Egypt on the run out of Egypt. And he retreated to Israel where in 167 BC, he burned Jerusalem, killing a multitude, about 80,000 Jews. So you can imagine 
uh, the death toll of that. And Israel was again just destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. Next slide. The, the Jews were forbidden to follow the Mosaic law. So you can imagine they couldn't follow the sacrificial uh, offerings. They couldn't follow the law of Moses in observing the Sabbath and their annual feasts or traditional sacrifices and the circumcision of children, which is in verse 11. The, the altars to idols were set up in Jerusalem and on December 16th, 167 BC, the Jews were ordered to offer unclean sacrifices and to eat swine's flesh, can you imagine, or be penalized by death. So this guy was brutal. He was beyond brutal. He was evil. And, uh, and he has an evil hatred toward God. That's why he did it this way. Next slide. Though his friends called him Epiphanes, the illustrious one. I'm sure he didn't have very many friends, but it says, no wonder the Jews called him Epimenes, which is the madman. So this madman is the little horn, and he was the forerunner of Antichrist. He was the picture of what this wicked, evil person that's coming in the future will be like. He was Satan incarnate, and I'm sure this man also had the power of Satan within him. And I don't mean a, a demon, I mean Satan. And everything that Satan would do, because he hates good, and he hates God, and he destroys everything. And uh, what he did to Israel and Jerusalem is really downright sickening. It's evil like um, we don't really get to see, thank God, in uh, most of history. But um, here's some of the wickedness that he did. And it's out of Maccabees. He, he used the temple to celebrate his pagan god, Bacchus, who was the god of pleasure and wines. So you can imagine the holy temple being turned into a... a, a, a well, there's a lot of terms for it, but an evil, wicked, drunken, orgy type of place. And how sickening that is to even thought of it. Uh, he used female prostitutes to offer sacrifices on the altar. How sickening. He hated the observance of the Sabbath, and so which was Saturday, the worship of God. And he forbade anyone from observing it. Uh, he burned every copy of the Torah he could get his hands on trying to remove God's truth. And in verse 12, it talks about it. He just, he took away truth. He brought down truth. So they couldn't read the truth about God. And he wanted to wipe it out. And he made the priests at times strip naked. These are the priests. And to play sports in front of the temple, kind of like we do the Olympic Games, right? Back then. And then they would, and so you can imagine how he would defile the priesthood and all of that, doing that kind of wickedness. So evil. Let me give you a couple of historical records so you can get a sense of it. He refused the practice of circumcision, as we said, <clears throat> which God commanded all the Jews to do as a sign of their, his covenant with them. And it says, and, he, <clears throat> and when two righteous women circumcised their boys anyway, how, 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 how amazing that is. In the middle of that defiance, they said, I'm going to honor God, not man. And they circumcised their boys. Well, he murdered the babies. And then he tied them to the mother's necks. And then he marched them through the streets. And then he threw them from the top of the temple walls to the stone streets below. The mothers and their children. In 2 Maccabees, it says this. Another courageous mother who had seven sons and honored the commands of the Lord to circumcise them. Antiochus, when he found out, he cut the tongues out of the boys and then he fried them. In the front of their in front of their mothers, one at a time, on a huge flat iron, just laid them on and roasted them in front of their mother. Then he murdered their their mother. So especially cruel and evil, but it is defiance against God. It's talking about you know saying God, I defy you openly, and for for a reason that we don't really understand. God allowed this to happen, and and uh, because uh, uh, again evil does move in this world and God will judge it. Um, but it is heartbreaking when we see this. Then the, the scripture records this, the, the, the desecration of the temple. And it refers to the day when this Antiochus, he went into the temple with a sow and a sow is a pig, but it's a female pig that's already given birth to litters. So it's complete defiance. It wasn't a, a, a male uh, firstborn, pure, uh, offering of the lamb, which we would think of Jesus. It was the, the exact opposite. It was like a, a woman 
pig who had already had all these litters and, and it shows all defiance. And he slit her throat and he offered her up on the brazen altar. Can you imagine that? And then he took the juice and the blood of that pig and he sprayed it all over the articles of the holy place. And this is called in scripture the abomination that causes desolation. And uh, it's an attack on God is what it is. And uh, and that's what it means in verse 10 when he when he grew up to the host of heaven and he caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth. It was an attack on God himself openly. And uh, so this interesting um, um, to see what this actually means. Uh, one commentator said this, he says, it's probably the best explanation is that this prophecy relates to the persecution and destruction of the people of God with its defiance of angelic hosts. Even the angels, he defied them who were to watch over Israel and the angels are charged that a special, uh, especially one angel. And, um, but um, he, de in defiance of them as well. And, uh, and he charged and defied the, the living God. So this was intentional. And this was not just a man doing blatant evil or evil by chance. It was Satan within him that said, I defy everything that you say, God. And of course, he was in defiance of, of God's plan to send Jesus, right? You'll never be able to bring your son here. And it was complete defiance of the offerings, which would be the offerings of God. He offered his own son, pure and spotless uh, to die in our place for our sins. And of course, it was an attack on God. So in verse 13, it says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long? <laughs> so the question is, how long will God let that kind of evil be flied in the face, you know, uh, in front of the whole world? And the Bible says, and he was telling us about the future, it's going to be... Um, in verse 14, it's going to be 2,300 evenings and mornings. That's how long Satan will be allowed to do this. The world is going to see, because of Israel, they are going to embrace their ant this Antichrist. They're going to think he's their savior. Three and a half years into this tribulation, they're going to watch this desecration of the temple. And when they see that, they're going to realize this is not our savior. It's, it, it's completely not our Savior. This is Satan incarnate. And from that time on, Satan, he'll rule the world through the Antichrist. And he will spend three and a half years hunting and trying to kill every Jew, Jewish person on, on the planet. But God will stand in for them. So 2,300 evenings and mornings, if you divide that in half, it would be about 1,500 days. So, uh, excuse me, 1,150 days, which is just about three and a half years. So God's not going to give him forever. But this is, you know, you say, well, why would he do this? What is the purpose in this? Um, we're looking at Antiochus Epiphanes who did this for a season but God is not talking about Antiochus Epiphanes when he's giving this to Daniel. He's talking about one that's yet to come. And he says the one that's yet to come is, and he says it in verse 17, and he says it in verse 19, that this has to do with the end of time, the end of time, as you look at both of those verses there, 17 and 19. Uh, verse 26, he says, the evenings and the mornings pertain to many days in the future. So this is speaking about the Antichrist. Well, how do we know that? How do we know it doesn't speak about just Antiochus Epiphanes who came and did all this evil? Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15 and 16, next verse there. Okay, I skipped that one. Sorry. Next one. There we go. No. No, I skipped that one too. So I'm moving fast behind you guys. There we go. All right. So therefore, he says, when you see the abomination of des uh, desolation, this is Jesus speaking. Um, and he's speaking right before he died on the cross and rose again. And he's telling the, the disciples, he's saying, listen, you need to warn the Jewish people. <laughs> and Matthew 24 is given to them. And he says, you need to be looking. And when you see this 
desolation, abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel. We're reading it in Daniel. The prophet standing in the holy place. Then those who are in Judea Judea must flee to the mountains. uh, Verse 21 and 22. Uh, For then there will be great tribulation. Next, Next slide. There we go. Be great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. So how bad is it going to be in the future on the earth? So bad, it's going to be worse than it's ever been or worse than it will ever will be from the time of creation. That's how bad it will be under this maniac. Verse 22 says, unless those days have been short, cut short, no life would have been saved But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. In other words, God's not going to let it go on forever. Man is basically going to get everything that he wants. He's going to get all the evil that he wants, all the selfishness that he wants, the defiance against God, which is what these nations um, ultimately want by their leaders there and this rebellion. And God says, you want that, you'll get that. In fact, you'll get it to the final degree with Satan himself. Uh, being your leader there. And, and and basically during that time, God's going to call him in. Don't you want to repent? Don't you want to turn back to God? And that's the purpose of these last days. This is not history, but this is future. And so how did the end of Antiochus come about, by the way? By the way, he did die. And uh, let me give you a little bit of history. A priest by the name of Matthias, uh, he had five sons, John, Simon, Judas, Eliezer, and Jonathan. And Matthias was grieved over all this wickedness as a priest and over the acts of Antiochus and uh, over the people of Israel. And one day an emissary was sent by Antiochus to make the people bow down to the God of Jupiter. And uh, Matthias, he was an old man at that point, he, um, he, he killed and slew the Jewish man who was leading people in this worship of Jupiter. He killed him on the spot in front of everybody. And then he turned and he killed the officer who was sent by Antiochus and he slew him too. He's like, I can't take any more. And he gave him the death penalty, which they deserved. And this led to what is called the Maccabean revolt. And um, Israel still speaks about it today. Then Matthias, when he died, he turned the torch over to his third son, Judas, who became known as Judas Maccabeus. Judas Maccabees, Judas the Hammer, who ultimately brought an end to the rule of Antiochus. And uh, he won the independence of the people of Israel from under the rule of Antiochus. And uh, when Judas went back into the temple to light the, the lamp, can you imagine what it looked like? And they cleared everything out and he went to, uh, to light the lamp. Uh, he only found one cruise of oil, uh, enough um, oil to only light the, the thing for one day. and uh, But the cruise of oil lasted eight days. Um, it lasted the whole time that they cleansed the temple. And so um, and this was the light of, of Israel going back out through God. And that date is was uh, uh, December 25th. And it's still celebrated today by the Jewish people as the Feast of Hanukkah. That's what the Feast of Hanukkah is. So you put Alexander the Great and you put Antiochus Epiphanes both together and all their evil, you wouldn't have, you'd be, you know, you could times that by a hundred and that's what the Antichrist is going to be like in these last days. I mean, pure evil. Uh, just as, as Alexander the Great was a real man, just as Antiochus Epiphanes was a real man, this Antichrist will be a real man and he will be overtaken and indwelt by, empowered by Satan himself. How do we know that? Verse 24 in our passage says, not by his own power, he'll be mighty, but it it won't be human power. It'll be supernatural power of Satan. And Satan has has power to deceive the earth. Revelation 13, 1 and 2 says this. I know these are coming quickly to you, but uh, next slide. There you go. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads on his horns. Uh, There were ten diadems, and on his heads 
were uh, blasphemous names. Now, this is all given again um, here to us now in the book of Revelation. So it was in Daniel, and now it's shown to us what this image, this beast would be like. And this is the beast uh, called the Antichrist. And the beast, which I saw, was like a leopard. Remember the leopard of uh, um, Alexander the Great? And his feet were like those of a bear. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. All these beasts, right? And the dragon, which was the final beast, gave him his power and his throne and great, and great authority. So we see he will actually have the authority of Satan. And he will be very good at deceiving the entire world earth. So verse 25, we see this at the end of verse 25 in this passage. It says that um, it, through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence and he will magnify himself in his heart and he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, which means he will uh, openly defy the, the true living God, but he will be broken without human agency. So when we look at Antiochus Epiphanes, we say, well, what happened to him in the end? Well, he died. Um, um, he, um, he mentally went insane and uh, God took him out. And uh, so nobody uh, killed him in that way. But God says, I'll, I will take you out. And he did take him out. But um the Bible says about this Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, next uh, scripture, he says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. By the way, the Bible says the last days there will be a falling away of Christ. Are you, are you in it for the whole hall? Are you willing to die for Christ? Are you going to serve him? Is he your king and is he your Lord? The Bible says in the last days people will, will drift away from the Lord. The church will move away. Uh, and it will it will um, will see the church um, uh, decrease. OK, it'll shrink away because there'll be less and less people who truly want to stand for the Savior, Jesus Christ, against all of the persecution of the world. And we see that right now It says, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of uh, destruction. And then the world will see him. It says. He is one who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. He will actually want to be worshipped as God. The Antichrist will. That's his goal. Satan wants to be God. He wants to rise above God and be worshipped as God. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And that's what this man will do, empowered by Satan. Next verse, God's going to take him out. That's good news. Second Thessalonians 2, 8 and 9. Then that lawless one will be revealed from whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. It's not going to be a tough fight for God. When he's done, he's done. And when he speaks, Satan is done. This Antichrist and this false prophet will both be taken out. And he will bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That, that is the one whose coming is in accordance with the activity of Satan. So the Bible says it very clearly. With all power and signs and false wonders. People reject the truth. So they're going to believe the lie of Satan. And that's what the world is doing right now. Satan will tell you lies. We live in a time where evil is called good. And good is called evil. How, how in the world could you think that? That's, we, we look at it and we go. Everybody knows that's wrong. And, um, but the Bible says Satan is so crafty. That, that in their minds they still know that is good. You're the evil one. And uh, that's what, uh, what, um, what happens. Now, uh, not by his own power. Revelation 13, 1 and 2. Next slide says this. This is how God will take him out. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Yeah, next slide. Revelation 13. I'm, I'm, I know I'm smoking along here. It's Revelation 13, 1 and 2. All right. Then it says, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. This is that dragon. And then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns, seven heads. We just uh, um, read that. And on his horns, ten, um, ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which, which I saw was li like the leopard. Excuse me, I'm reading this again here. Um, 
But the last part says, and the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. So again, he will um, show himself. Oh, I'm sorry. I went backwards, didn't I? Man, what's the matter with me? Okay, Revelation 19, sorry. I don't know why I went to the top of the page. That's just bizarre. Okay, here we go. We're talking about his end. This will this will be good. Okay, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So in the very end, the very end of the tribulation, this Antichrist will gather all the, the armies, the mighty armies of the earth, and he will bring them to attack, not just Jerusalem. This will be weird, but armies will be traveling to attack Jesus. The Bible says he's going to appear in the air. And Satan says, no, I'm going to take you out. And, uh, and so this is how it's going to unfold. He says, uh, um, it says, and they assembled war to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Can you imagine uh, armies actually trying to fight somebody in the air? And here's the Lord in the air. And the Bible says he's with the armies, which is us, his bride behind him on white horses with him. And, uh, and then he says, verse 20, and the beast was seized. Not much of a battle. And with him, the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, both of them he snatches up, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. So basically he took them out in front of the entire earth. And, and the whole earth was able to watch God take both of these men and their bodies. And he took them out and he put them straight into eternal hell. Now, these are the only two guys that I know of who are, gonna, who are gonna, not going to face the great white throne judgment. They're going to bypass that. They're going to go straight into hell in front of everybody. And, uh, and then he's going to grab uh, Satan himself and he'll take him and he'll put him away. And he'll chain him in the bottomless pit. Um, for the time of the um, millennial kingdom. Then Daniel says this in, in verse 27. I'll wrap up here. He says, Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days after getting this vision. Can you imagine going through history and watching all this? And then being able to go into the future and see the wickedness and the evil that will be done by this man. He was sick. He was sick for his people Israel. Do you mean we're going to go through all of that? Yeah. He would have hoped that Israel would have just come back from 70 years of captivity. Who would have, they would have repented, turned to the Lord with their whole heart. And then when Jesus came, they would have received them as their Messiah. And, and, they, and that would have been it for all of us too. But God knew they wouldn't. They wouldn't accept their king. And he gave us more time, which is called the church. And we're in that time of the church. So for Israel, God, the Lord Jesus tells, you're looking you're looking for an antichrist. You need to keep your eyes looking for the antichrist because you're not looking for me as your Messiah and king. And that's why Jesus told him, he says, when you see this, Israel. And so they're looking for the coming of the antichrist. We're not looking for the coming of the antichrist, and, um, which is sad. But we, the church, we're looking for the appearance of Christ in the air. Now, this isn't the second coming of the Lord, but the Bible says this last slide in 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 18. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. He's going to bring the dead uh, believers, he's going to give them new bodies as well. And that we're going to uh, be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we're going to get our new bodies. But it says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Isn't that amazing? I know this can be very scary to see all this evil coming, and, but we need to know as believers what's coming. And this is what's coming. But it's coming to the world in judgment for their defiance against God. 
But it's not the plan of God for us, his church. The Bible says he will not allow us. We already suffer as believers, and we should be willing to die as believers. And uh, the church was, you know, pummeled in many ways all throughout the centuries. People were burned alive, burned on stakes, hung, crucified, all of that, even in the early church uh, for their faith in the Lord. But the Bible says before this happens, he's going to take his church out and he's going to catch us away. So we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I don't want you to be afraid today. I just want your eyes to be open. Um, to understand the time of the end. To understand where this is going. And we can also keep our eyes uh, looking for the Lord to come to receive his church. But we should also keep our eyes on Israel. If you're a Bible student, Israel is the key to the unfolding of um, the nations uh, and their defiance against God and the end times. All of prophecy runs through one pe- group of people, Israel. God made a promise to Abraham a long time ago. And he said, listen, I will fulfill that. You, your people will inherit this land. And one day they will worship me. I will graft them back into the vine. And uh, during the millennial kingdom, Israel will love and serve the Lord It'll be a time of history that we have never seen. And uh, they will be a light, uh, just as God promised to all of the earth, of who Jesus is during the millennial kingdom of God. So keep your eyes on Israel. Saw uh, Benjamin Netanyahu this last week. He was the only one in American history who has spoken to Congress five times. And uh, he was able to speak uh, to um, all of our elected officials uh, pass, surpassing Winston Churchill. And uh, so in our day, in all of the history of America, there's only one man or one representing one nation who's come to sp- speak to us more than anyone. And it's from this little nation of Israel. And when he spoke, um, it made my heart uh, think of what's coming for Israel. And uh, of all the things that he said is true, um, God is going to stand with Israel, but they have to turn their heart to him. And uh, so um, I'm praying for Israel to come to know the Lord and for the plans of God. Let me pray for us. Lord, there's a lot to take in. This is a lot of scripture. This is overwhelming, but uh, you said it over and over and over again. You said it to Israel many times, describing what's coming for them. You, then you gave it to us in the New Testament to the church, and you described very clearly that we're not the end end all. <laughs> There's going to be a day when the time of the church is going to be done at the end of the of the um, times of the Gentiles. And you're going to take the church away, your bride, as you promised. But in the end, it will be uh, the focus will be on Israel one more time at this time. They'll they'll turn their hearts to you and they'll look on him whom they pierce. The Bible says and they'll weep. And Lord, I look for that salvation. I look for the whole earth, Lord, to see your son, Jesus uh, your beauty, your your love, your holiness, your goodness. Um, Lord, I know it'll be trampled on by the Antichrist, but the world will see the victory over evil and the coming of the Savior, our Savior, your Son, Jesus. And uh, it's good for us to know these things, Lord, as we live in this world. Would you be with us? Would you encourage us? Would you strengthen us? Lord, to be a light in these days, Lord, our last days as a church, and uh, would you use us, Lord, to bring in more of the Gentile world to you and and also some of the, you know, small bit of Israel that's, uh, you know, still still believing in you, which is great. We just turn all of this to you, Lord, not to be afraid, but to realize that you're in charge and uh, you will come and you will defeat wickedness and evil. And we're so thankful for that. Give you praise and thanks today in Jesus name. Amen.